All right, welcome to the uh, data science, machine learning, and a ethics and AI track. Uh, my name is Benoit Mlin. I'll be co-chairing this track over the next three days with uh, Fatma Tarlachi. Um, <clears throat> a thing, uh, following the presentations, if uh, you have a question that you'd like to ask, We'll have some handout microphones, but we'd rather not walk the room, so please come to our table and we'd be glad to help you out. Otherwise, you can also type your questions into Slack and uh, the speaker will be uh, happy to respond over there. Um, we have a full track, really, lots of good talks. Stick around with us and uh, let's start this full complement of talks with Exploring the Milky Way by Francesc Alfred. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. So, yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, how to explore the Milky Way, or in particular any other n-dimensional data set. So the agenda for today would be um, to expose what the Gaia data set is, then I will do a small introduction to the BLOSC to NDIM and ND array objects. Then how to automatically uh, do fine tuning on compression with BTune. Then we will do an actual demonstration of how we can explore the Milky Way with BLOSC 2. And then uh, we will conclude the talk. So first of all, I would like to say that um, I am not attached to the Gaia collaboration at all. And uh, any statement said here about scientific facts may be plain wrong. So take them with a grain of salt, please. OK, so I had this, uh, this the inspiration for this talk after seeing a session on my, uh, in the pla at the planetarium of, of my hometown on the Mediterranean coast in Spain. And the, the, the documentary was about the Gaia mission, OK? Uh, that it's um, uh, the goal for the Gaia mission is to measure the positions of the stars in the Milky Way and a lot of other info. It is a, a mission from the European Space Agency and uh, the Gaia telescope orbits around L2 point, which recently James Webb joined too. So they are uh, friends, close friends actually. And uh, the mission was launched uh, uh, 10 years ago, in 2013, and it is accumulating data since then, continuously. Uh, one of the important things for uh, measuring the positions of the stars is to, mm, to, to calculate the distance, right? So Gaia is designed to, to use parallax in order to measure the distance to nearby uh, stars, okay? Everyone, I suppose, if, uh, knows what the parallax is, but um, the idea is when the telescope is in the opposite sides of the sun, the, um, <coughs> the, per the, the perception of the star changes with respect to the, far, to the farthest stars. Okay, so let's go with the, how the Gaia dataset um, looks like. So <coughs> Gaia is continuously observing lar large regions as more um, uh, as more observations uh, are accumulated. So in the, in the beginning, there was a predecessor of the Gaia uh, mm -hmm. mission, which is called the Iparcos, okay? It was another European mission, and Iparcos was able to catalog uh, thousands of uh, stars. And then, uh, since Gaia uh, launched, uh, for example, in 2017, they released the first uh, data release, and they were able to catalog uh, several um, several hundred uh, thousand, okay? But at the, I've stat in the latest release uh, that was released past year, uh, the number of, of the distance of the, of the catalog has increased uh, very, very uh, much. And now in the, the green region, Gaia has cataloged already uh, one, more than one billion of stars, which is a, which is a staggering, uh, amount, actually. Uh, for our purposes, we are going to restrict ourselves to, to a sphere, 
uh, that is uh, with a radius of 10,000 uh, light years, okay? Um, I, choose, I have chosen that because it's a round number, okay? Um, but uh, this includes already a third of the total catalog, which is uh, around uh, five, 500 million of stars, which is pretty good, I would say. Okay, so the Gaia main source catalog is a set of public CSV files with many star parameters. But for uh, the purposes of, of the talk, we are interested mainly in the right ascension, the declination, and uh, also the distance uh, GSP uh, hot, GSP hot, uh, which is uh, a combination of parallax with other um, with other techniques that I, I am not able to uh, to talk about because I am not an expert on that. We just uh, the, the important thing is that this is this is listed in the CSV files and you can read it. And this is the the best um, distance uh, measurement that Gaia can provide. And from this, and using some spherical, uh, some elemental spherical geometry, we can read and filter the stars in, in this radius of 10,000 light, mm, 10,000 light years. The conversion is is quite easy. Just apply the, the matrix uh, transformation, okay? But beware because angles must, must be in radians, and in the CSV files, uh, angles uh, are are stated in degrees. So at the beginning. That drives me mad uh, before uh, data starts to, to make sense. And then, once we have this sphere, we, we have the exploration cube, okay? So the exploration cube is, is, uh, is, is, is the cube that inscribes the sphere, which is uh, 10,000 light years. And uh, the length of the cube, cube side, it's uh, 2,000 light years. And every cell in the cube is one cubic light year. Okay. And that amounts for one trillion, uh, eight trillion cells, which is uh, seven, more than seven terabytes of, of size. Okay. And now the challenge is to how, how, how to explore a multi-terabyte data set on a laptop like mine that has only eight gigabytes of RAM and uh, 260 to 256 gigabytes of, uh, of hard disk, solid state disk, uh, which only 50 gigabytes free, okay? So it's going to be uh, uh, an important challenge. And of course, the only solution for doing that is to use compression, but we need, we need compression to work really well, not, not anything would work. So to give you an idea, the number of, sta of, of stars in the sphere of radius, of, of this radius is uh, around uh, uh, 5 billion of stars, and sparsity is one in 10,000 cells, okay? So essentially there is one, one star, and then uh, there is uh, 10,000 cells that doesn't have any star at all. And the solution must, uh, must handle sparse data effectively, of course, because this is a clear example of, of sparse data set. And if the final goal is real-time exploration, as we will see, it has to support also fast multidimensional slicing, okay? So these are the requirements for our solution. And for, uh, for handling that, uh, let's enter BLOS2 Ending, okay? Which is a highly effective library made in C and, uh, um, and Python with Python wrappers for handling multidimensional and potentially sparse data sets. So a small introduction to BLOS. So BLOS is, um, is, a, is a compressor who, that splits the data in blocks for better cache use, okay? So the idea is to, to compress everything, to transport all these blocks into the, into the caches of the CPU, and then compress inside of the, of, of the, of the CPU in order to get best performance. It can also use different filters like shuffle, bit shuffle, and, and co in combination with codecs, which are in charge of doing the actual compression, like LZ4, ZLIF, set standard, and BLOSK LZ. And it is optimized for binary data. data. So Blosk is used in many different places already. So probably you, you have been using Blosk, maybe without knowing that. So HDF5 and H5i uh, has access to Blosk via the HDF5 plugin. Uh, then PyTables also has native support for, for Blosk. ZAR, 
which is the default, uh, Blosk is the default codec uh, when, you, when you're using ZAR. And then Iron Array, which, is, which uses the latest version, which is Blosk 2. So all in all, lots of terabytes are compressed and decompressed every day in the world using Blosk. Also, Blosk received uh, the, the Google's open source uh, peer bonus um, in 2017. And I am pretty uh, honored to be, uh, to, 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 to see our project uh, mm, at the same, uh, at the same time that many other projects like SQLite or NumPy or Flask were also nominated. So what's BLOS2? So BLOS2 is the next generation of BLOS. It has support for full 63-bit 60, containers instead of 31, that was uh, BLOS1. And that means that there is no limitation, no practical limitation in the, in the amount of storage that you want to to compress. It has support for uh, enhanced support for sparse data, as we will see. Uh, it supports also fully dimensional double partitioning. I will that I will develop later on. And it has support for meta layers for adding information for applications and users. So <coughs> BLOS2 and DIM is, uh, is a way to uh, endow multidimensional meaning uh, for mm, in the C library for, uh, for storing data. So each ND array is split in chunks, as you can see uh, in the um, in the yellow, yellow part, and every chunk is uh, uh, at its time also split in what is called blocks, okay? And both blocks and chunks can be multidimensional. And this is something that which is very unique, and probably a uh, block two is the only uh, library that can support that right now. You can see more uh, on the reference uh, API in the there. And key, an ND array is the wrapper for Python, okay? So for uh, mm, the wrapper uh, tries to mimic as much as possible the NumPy API. We don't try to reinvent the wheel. And uh, it comes with efficient conversion from two NumPy arrays. It also supports flexible resizing and also shrinking, so you can enlarge and shrink your, your data sets. And you can create arrays both in memory or on disk whatever you want. Here you have an example, okay, where you, you created the array, you do an, a resize, and you do a, an assignation, and you can see the, the result there. So it's, it's pretty easy, and it follows the, 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 the standard APIs. So the important thing about the second partition is that it allows for much more selective and faster queries. So in other solutions like HDF5, ZAR, or others, whenever you want, for example, to retrieve uh, a plane in a 3D dimensional array, you need to decompress much more data, right? The, the, the yellow part in, in this, in this in, uh, on the right. Uh, on its part, BLOS2 and DIM uh, needs to retrieve much, uh, you can be much more specific and you need to retrieve much less data, okay? And that means faster, uh, mm, faster data retrievals for for um, for um, <coughs> slices. Here we have an, um, a, a base mark where we compare BLOS2 against A5Pi uh, with using BLOS2, also with ZAR, which is using BLOS1, and A5Pi using BLOS1 as well. And in the in the y-axis, you you have the speed in gigabytes per second. And this is the slicing, the, the slicing speed along different, different uh, axes using the same codec. So all the libraries are using exactly the same codec. And you can see that when, when the codec is used through BLOS2, there is a, a high boost in performance uh, regard, uh, with, with respect to, to the other solutions. Okay. And also an important thing about uh, BLOS2 is that um, um, it has uh, Mm, good support for for sparse data, and this is probably the, the, the responsible for being so efficient in this in this kind of, of retrievals. 
Also, uh, on the on the left, you you have the the, the, the performance when you use one thread, and the, in, on the right, the performance when you're using uh, 16 threads. And you can see that uh, this codec in particular is not suffering that much when using one single thread. So that means that any laptop, even if it has a very small number of cores, can be compressed very efficiently. And here we have the file sizes for the 3D array that we already introduced for Gaia dataset. And we can see that this uh, seven terabytes uh, dataset, the Gaia dataset, can be reduced uh, when using the, this BLOSK LZ codec to less than 15 gigabytes, okay, which is a big reduction. Whereas <coughs> ZAR or H5Pi using BLOSK1 can reduce much less because BLOSK1 doesn't have a specific support for sparse data. Uh, then if, you, if we use Z standard, which is a much powerful codec, it's slower, but it's, it compresses much, much, much better, we can see that mm, the size for the total data set can be reduced until less than two gigabytes. So we are compressing seven, seven terabytes in less than two gigabytes. Okay. And that's um, a factor of more than 4,000 uh, compression ratio. Of course, BLOS2 is not re the result of uh, one, one, one people, okay? Is, is the result of a multi-year effort with, uh, with, a, with, a, mm, with a team. And uh, all of these guys has collaborated in one way or another during, during the making of uh, the next version of BLOS, which is BLOS. Okay, so uh, I, I will start um, describing Bitune, which is a way to well, as I said before, BLOSK supports many different codecs and different filters. And when you, when you start to combine different codecs, different filters with different codes, and different block sizes, and different uh, way to structure data, you, you get an explosion of parameters that you, you can be confused. Which ones are the correct ones that you need to use in order to, um, to do the, the um, to, to, to access the, the best way you want to, because sometimes you want fast access and sometimes you want, you prefer reduce the size to the maximum. And so we created Bitune for that. And Bitune, it's a, it's a fine tuning compression, it, it, it's, it allows to, to fine tune uh, compression performance. Um, and the idea is to, to have different states that, um, uh, can can be checked. This this can be seen. Oh, I am not connected to internet. Oh my god. Okay. That's my fault. Sorry about that. Well, uh, you can go to the um, to the URL. But the idea is that um, it has several states. So, for example, it starts in the in the state of codec filter, and it starts to to check different combinations. Okay. When this and th this this uh, mm, the algorithm keeps this, the one that provides the best score, and then it starts it, it starts to check another parameter and then another parameter. So in the end, it comes up with with uh, with a with a good combination. Okay. Okay. So there are three different operation modes in Bitune. There is Bitune Free, which uses the dynamic Bitune plugin that directly. So we will see. Then there is Bitune models, which uses artificial intelligence in order to find, uh, the BLOS development team uh, will find a neural network model which is adapted to your dat data sets for faster operation. And then there is Bitune Studio, which use the training package, uh, the users can use the training package locally to generate your own models uh, uh, for your data sets by, by yourself. So installing Bitune plugin, it's, uh, it's very easy. It's just, uh, we provide binary wheels for, for that. So you just install, pip install BLOS2 Bitune, and that's all. And using it is, is also very easy. You just add uh, the environment variable, Bitune trade-off. Oops. What's happened? 
Okay. Plug and unplug, maybe that works. Okay, it's working. So whenever you are creating a, an array, you will see this, um, <coughs> you can specify the, the trade-off. So the trade-off is you are telling Bitune what you prefer. If you prefer more speed, you say a trade-off which is close to zero, okay? And if you prefer more compression ratio, uh, you say, uh, you specify a, a trade-off which is closer to one. In this case, a trade-off of 0 0.5, 0 0.5 means that we want a balance, okay, between the speed and, and compression ratio. And then Btune is able to, to do that. Then, um, uh, we have the Btune, the, the Btune models, and this is a, an operation mode where Btune is trained for your data sets and can infer in real time, um, chunk by chunk, the right combination for, of codec and filter that suits the requirements, okay? So you can specify, you, can f you, you want to favor a speed, you want to favor compression ratio, or just a trade-off. And then, uh, it is trained for, for that, and for example, for different trade-offs, this this, these are predictions for the Gaia dataset that we are working on, and for the different uh, trade-offs, we have different combinations of, of codecs and filters that, that are being predicted. So trade -off, low tr lower trade-offs um, achieves less, less compression ratio, but they achieve much higher speed. Okay? The speed and uh, co compression speed and the, and the compression speed are measured in gigabytes per second. Here we see um, the result of the, tr of the, of the training. And for different trade-offs, for example, 0, 1 or 0, 6 or 0, uh, 0, 9, we can see that um, the performance matches the, spe the expectations, okay? So when we, the trade-off trade is towards zero, we have much, we have better performance. Um, and when the, when the trade-off is close to one, we have less performance, but better compression ratio. Also, you, we can see that here that using single threading is fine for trade-offs, favor and speed, because in that case, CPU is not the bottleneck. The bottleneck is the, is the, is the memory bandwidth in general. So here, there are some testimonials. So people, this, this, these guys participated in, the, in our beta, beta program, and they, they, were, they were pleased to, to use BLOS2 and Bitune. And then let's go with the, with the um, interactive part, exploring the, 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 the Gaia data. So we will be able to explore, this is the cube of, of the Gaia, and then on the, um, the red box, we will be slicing this, this, um, this red box, sliding, sorry, around different axes, X, Y, and Z axis. So this is the, um, The notebook, I am going just to, to explain that you can select the travel that you want, uh, you want to explore, the data set, okay? And now it is, it is doing the slices for all the, all the, all the, uh, the, the, the axes. And here we have, we, we see the volumetric data and if we, if we do the, um, the play, we can see that we are traveling in the X axis, okay? So we are slicing these seven terabytes data set in real time in this, uh, in this laptop. And you can also do it, do it manually. Here we are close to, the, to our sun, and we can see that we have much more stars near to the sun because Gaia is able to, to discover them easily. Okay, so this is uh, this is it. 
So to conclude, uh, BLOS2 and DIMM and NDRA can be used to easily handle such a huge sparse matrices representing large spatial volumes. And double partition um, uh, allows to explore them effectively. And BTUN allows for automatically selection of BTUN uh, allows for automatic selection of the best BLOS2 compression parameters. All in all, BLOS2 represents a highly effective, efficient, and flexible tool for compressing your data your way. I always like to thank uh, donors and contracts that allow our team to continue doing our work. Okay, and uh, without them, we could not have possible put BLOS2 into production and status. So. Also, let me pay tribute for, to these guys because uh, probably I wouldn't be doing a talk about exploring the, the Milky Way data set without uh, uh, their inspiration. So thank you guys. Uh, thank you in, be uh, in behalf of the BLOSS collaboration. Thank you. I will be happy to, to take any questions. Thanks. Any question for Francesc? <clears throat> so I have one. Um, Btune is proposed as a learning framework for the parameters of a compressor. Yes. Does it come with some out of the box settings that are quote unquote good enough for a uh, certain That's payloads? That's a good question. It depends on your, on your needs. I mean, if you are comfortable with good enough, Okay, then then it's fine. But if you are trying to to to, um, to save every byte that you are trying to export, for example, this is not. You need a, an automatic uh, algorithm. Okay, so so you play besides such things as gzip and zstd mm -hmm. for when good enough is not good enough. Yeah, it could be good enough, but it depends on the on the scenario, right? I mean, depending. Maybe you want extreme. Um, uh, extreme speed, and then Z standard or Z lib are not good for that, and you require a, a, um, an algorithm that can help you in deciding which are the, 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 the best ones. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Come over. Uh, hi. Very very cool talk. Uh, I had a, just a question. C if you go in an arbitrary direction like X Y Z, does it? Change the performance, or no? Actually, no. I think. Uh, yeah, I I forgot to mention, but in the in the x-axis we have the different uh, the axis zero, one, and two refers to to axis x, y, and z. Okay, and as you can see, there is very small um, difference in differences in performance, and that's because the the partitions has been has been designed to be. Um, um, the, the same size on all the directions. So essentially you get the same performance in all the directions. Which is also quite quite um, striking because in general there is always a privileged direction, right? When, when, when you get best performance. But if you, if you design well your, your block size and your chunk size, then you can get this sort of. And one last quick one from Slack. Um, Nicholas Gates asks, why stop at only two levels of chunking or double partitioning? <laughs> and can Btune help select the shapes of these partitionings? Yeah, so why stop? Well, first of all, implementing the second partition took us like a couple of years of effort. <laughs> so it's not easy to, to implement. <laughs> that's, uh, that's an important thing. And, uh, but yeah, it, it is true, we can, we can implement one more. The, the idea under the double partitioning is because there are, in the CPUs, there are the cache, there are, there are caches that are shared between the different cores, and there are caches that are private for the cores, okay? So the idea is to, 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 to match the size of the first partition in the private caches for best performance, and then to match the second partition, the size, for the for the shared cache L3 typically okay between the cores and that's the the, the way to, to get the best performance I don't know if adding a third partition would would buy you a lot of things okay but everything can be done and then the second part of the question was Btune if uh, it helps and what so. 
uh, whether Btune can help select the shapes of these partitions. The shapes, mm, no, fortunately no. You need to specify which, which, which is the shape that uh, you, you want to prefer. But we, we provide hints in the sense that the shapes should fit in the, in the caches of, of the CPU, in the private or shared caches of the CPU. All right, so we have one more from Slack, uh, so from Shubham Jha. Uh, could this be used in calculating similarity scores or distances between points, which traditionally has quadratic complexity through Euclidean measurements? Um, sorry, uh, you need to repeat the, the question. That's, uh... So uh, <coughs> could this, meaning the, the tensor representation yes. that you can explore fast. Could this be used to calculate similarity scores or distances between points, which typically takes quadratic time complexity mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing it in, in uh, yeah. uh, sort of Euclidean sort of yeah. list uh, of To tell the truth, I, I didn't thought, uh, I didn't think about, about this, this exactly problem. The only thing that I can say is that if, if the distance are fits in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the chunks, for example, it is much faster because um, everything can be decompressed in the, in, the, in the CPU caches, okay? So that, that could help in accelerating this kind of, of, of computations. But of course, if the distances are very far away, mm, I mean, it's, it's difficult to, to get, to get best, best performance, or good performance, okay? Let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much.